Please open up your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians. We'll be in chapter 3, and we'll be beginning in verse 9, and make our way through the rest of the, of the chapter. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 9. For what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account? as we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you, so that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. Let's pray. Father, I come before you with an exceptional burden, at least on my part. Lord, this passage has revealed so much this week to me and about me. How such a small passage, Lord, could be like a hammer. And if the scripture is my friend, then I have been wounded by a friend this week. But, oh Lord, thank you so much for your word. And knowing what I've learned, Lord, I know that the change is not going to be wrought in a day or a week. But I pray, Lord, that you would teach me to love and teach our congregation to love as Christ loved as Paul the Apostle sought to imitate your Son, that we would love. In Jesus' name, amen. I count it one of the greatest privileges of my life to have spent the last couple of weeks with you teaching you. It means more to me to be able to teach here than it does anywhere else in the world. What I'm going to teach tonight is it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be eloquent. I don't even know if there'll be much power or sense in it all. But I can tell you that rightly understanding this passage, um, I won't say that it transforms your life immediately, but I will say it, it's like a hammer, that, um, like a light that exposes things that are wrong, like a hammer that knocks you back into the place where you ought to be, or at least begins to knock you back there. You know, um, years ago I read The Voyage of the Dawn Treader in the Chronicles of Narnia, C.S. Lewis, and they find a man as they're in the boat and they're traveling, making this long sea journey. They find a man in this pitch black darkness and he's utterly terrified. I mean, he is beyond terror. He's pale with terror. He's insane with terror. And when they pull him out of the water, their question is, you know, what has terrified you so? And he's saying, flee, flee this darkness. Why? Why should we flee? We're brave men. We're sailors. And he says, no, flee. And they said, why? And he said, this is the place where all your dreams come true. And as the sailors heard that, they were smiling. They were, wow. All right. Why, why would we run from this? And he says, you don't understand. This is the place where all your dreams come true. And at that moment, you saw the joy on the sailors' faces turn into terror. Why? Because something they thought they understood, they didn't understand. And the moment they understood it, really understood it, it 
just literally came like a cataclysmic flood, like a fireball out of heaven. And they turned around and they ran for everything they were worth. Well, that's kind of the way this passage has been. And I hope that this passage is for you. We say that it really is in the Christian life all about love. That it's all about selfless love. And we can say that over and over and over and never really truly even begin to understand what we're saying. It just becomes cliche. And then every once in a while, it's like God just kind of pulls back the curtain and you go, what have I been saying? If this is true, it doesn't make the Christian life easy. It makes it impossible apart from the Spirit of God. And it makes entrance into heaven. Oh, the law? All the requirements of the law? They pale in their demands compared to this one thing. To love. Because the one who has loved has kept all the law of God. And it gets to the point where you sit there and go, I'm not mature because of my theological complexity. I'm not mature because I understand certain things and teach them to the saints. I'm only mature to the degree that I love. And so we're going to look. I'm, I'm going to lash myself to my notes. There's so many things here I want to say. I don't think I'll say them clearly, but pray. And pray that God will open up your heart and mind to see something. That once you see it, you're going to be glad you saw it. And then at the same time, you're going to wish you hadn't seen it. Because you see the demands of the Christian life. And it really is all about love. Selfless love. And I want us to look at four results tonight in our passage of selfless love. One is joy in love others joy in others the other is thanksgiving for others and the other is prayer on behalf of others and then finally ministry to others four things that we see in this passage that are the result of a heart that loves as the Lord Jesus loved that loves as the Apostle Paul sought to love and so let's look at that let's begin in verse 9 for what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account? If we truly love, then when we see spiritual progress and blessing in the people of God as a congregation like this or in the life of a single individual, it will lead to inward joy. It'll make us forget about us and lead to inward joy. And that inward joy will lead to a manifestation of visible rejoicing. Do you see that? How can you know if you really love when you look at your brothers and sisters in Christ? Are you so concerned for them? Or are you all wrapped up in your own concern? How do you know that you love? It's when you see them grow. You see them learn. You see them progress in the faith. You have joy unspeakable. Because your life is no longer about you. It's about them. It's about, about others. Here in this text, I, I think it's very important that Paul uses the word joy and rejoice. The Greek word, chada, is the noun form of joy. But then he takes the verb form of that noun, chido. And it's like he's, he's I don't know, he's like just almost repeating himself. I, I rejoice with joy. I'm rejoicing in joy. I joy in joy. He's, he's doing everything in his power to emphasize the joy that is in his heart because of other people. Now, I'm not like that. So I know a lot. You can't get the, the, the first thing down. You know a lot. 
But maybe you're so caught up in yourself thinking about you that when, when you, you, you don't even look or I don't even look at what's happening in other people. So the, what it like Christianity 101 and I've already failed. My love, your love is manifested when we have joy, even though we're suffering, we have joy because we look out and we see the beautiful thing that God is doing in other people's lives, in our church, in individuals. You see, that kind of joy can only come when you're not distracted with self. You see that? When you're always looking at others, you're concerned about others. Now, he also says joy here in verse 9, and I find this kind of interesting. He says, the joy with which we rejoice before our God. Now, I know we read that and we think rejoicing before our God, but let's put that in the context of Isaiah 6. In the year the king Isaiah died, I saw also the Lord high and lifted up, and his train, the train of his robe filled the temple, and above him stood the seraphim, each one having with two wings, each one having six wings, and with two wings they covered their face, and with two wings they covered their feet, and with two they did fly. And they cried to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of Him who cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me! I'm undone! Now here is this godly Isaiah in the presence of, of this kind. So when we... In this kind of God, this holy, holy God. And yet Paul is saying that he's rejoicing before this God, unhindered, extravagantly, lavishly. He is rejoicing in the presence of God without embarrassment, without shame. And you say, yes, Paul, that's because of the finished work of Christ on his behalf and his comprehension of that. Yes, but there's another reason. You see, he was wild with joy before the presence of his God. But that emotion, that joy came out of a heart of selfless love. The end of all the commandments is to love as Jesus loved. Love fulfills the law. This was a, a pure and blameless emotion because it wasn't caught up in self, but it was the result of his great concern for others. I mean, the, the idea here is almost, I, I think sometimes of David, you know, as he's dancing and rejoicing before the Lord. It's scandalous to most in Israel, but to God it's pleasing because it was this heart that was just full of thanksgiving for God. In this case, it's a heart. Paul's heart full of thanksgiving to God, but because of what God had done, not for Paul for what he'd done for others. I mean, if my whole world was crashing down around me, but my brothers and sisters in Christ were prospering, I asked myself this question. Would I have this kind of joy? Because that's the measurement of whether or not I truly love, isn't it? It really is. I'm also reminded of John's attitude when he wrote in 3 John 1, 4, I have no greater joy than this. Than what? Than my children. But I hear that they're walking in the truth. No greater joy. You can't take away my joy, even here on the Isle of Pathmos, because I hear that my children are walking in the truth, that God's children are okay. They're doing all right. You see the selflessness that's there. Now, the main point that I want to make here in this is that inexpressible joy is only possible to the degree that you and I grow in selfless love. A mean, stingy, self-centered heart does not have the capacity for this kind of joy. It doesn't. Now, let me give you an example from a friend of mine that I haven't seen in years, but I'll never forget him, Marty Brown. And he's a pastor in Paducah, Kentucky. I think he may still be pastoring there. That's, 
And, and he, because of an operation and a mistake that a doctor made, he had to be sent to Nashville, and he was literally laying in his deathbed, full of infection in his throat, terrible, terrible pain. And I found out, as soon as I got back from Peru, I was in the airport, someone called, Marty's in the hospital, he could die, his pain is extraordinary, could you go visit him? And I'll never forget walking into that hospital room and Marty, his classical clapping his hands together like this, he's laying there on his back in horrifying pain, tubes and wires and everything. He looks as he hears the door open and his face lights up. I'll never forget this. And he goes, oh, oh, praise God that I see your face. Oh, Brother Paul, I've been so worried about you in Peru. I'm so glad that you're okay. And he went on and on and on. And it's one of those lives where you sit there and go, he's never going to be a famous preacher. He's never going to write a book. I can't carry this guy's sandals. Why? I mean, everything I talk about is a reality in him. We all just think we're in a competition to know more. And the guy who knows the most gets to go speak in all the conferences. It just shows you how skewed everything is. You see that? Now, I don't want to leave you with this but, uh, without any help, so I want to say two things. One, it's a benefit. It is a great benefit to learn to love like this. It is a great benefit to you to the degree that you increase in selflessness not thinking about you, to that degree, your capacity for joy grows exponentially. You see, everything that Jesus commands and demands of you is for your benefit. Another thing I want to just talk about, well, how, Brother Paul, you're telling us we ought to do this. How do we do it? First of all, I want to say this, renewing the mind. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't, we can't get past that first step. It begins in renewing the mind. You're, you're not going to hear about love like this in the secular world or from fallen men. It's ludicrous. It's crazy. It's unnatural. So we've got to go to the Scriptures and we've got to renew our mind. Second thing we must do is repent of self-love. When you see it, go after it like Israel was to go after the, the Philistines, the Canaanites. Go after it with a sword. Give it no mercy, because it'll show you none. Just kill it. Not because you want to be a morbid type of hermit, but because you want joy. You know this thing is going to kill your joy. So kill it first. Just kill it. Also crying out to God, prayer. Because regardless of all the wisdom about you may know the doctrine of love inside and out, but without prayer, you'll not have the power to live it. Also, persevering in relationships, especially the difficult ones. It's the training ground. Relationships are the training ground for this kind of love, and especially the difficult ones. Let me give you an example. Have you ever noticed a parent of a severely challenged child? I have. I've, I've seen a few. And I hope you've seen the same thing. Being in that relationship with that severely challenged or handicapped child did something to them. They were just different. I, I don't want anybody to write me and say I've got bad theology, but common grace, I think, will allow me to say I've even seen this in unbelievers. Especially a lot of times when there's a severely challenged child and, and the father decides he's had enough and just leaves. And there's the woman alone all her life dedicated to feeding, bathing, taking care of this child with almost no benefit being received and the person is somehow transformed. Also, marriage relationship, this whole idea of compatibility is so, so wrong. God, for the most part, brings two people together who aren't compatible at all. Why? So that they learn unconditional love. They learn this kind of love. And see, even if your marriage isn't exactly where you want it to be, let me share something. 
The first thing the enemy's going to do in your life is say it's meaningless. Your years are passing and it's meaningless. No, it's not. Every rasp of that bad relationship is changing you. It's changing you. Now, so it's joy that is one of the results of selfless love. Now, another result is thankfulness for others. Thankfulness. In verse 9 again, For what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account? The joy in our lives that result from us seeing God work in other people, in the people that we love, it leads to a sense of permanent indebtedness to God. A debt from which we'll never be free. A, a debt which is paid by thanksgiving and, and by service. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, when I look at the life of the Apostle Paul and his writings and the life of other men, when I look at 2,000 years of church history and the sages that have come and gone that did not write inspired but left us indeed something that was beneficial, I have found this, that thankfulness is the hallmark of godly men and women. Thanksgiving is the hallmark of godly men and women. Hold your place in 1 Thessalonians and just run over to Colossians. Just go to your left, one book. Colossians. Look at 3.16. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God. Paul, you already said that. I'm saying it again. The thankfulness permeates the life of of the godly. Look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 in the book that we're studying. Look at verse 16. Rejoice always. Always in the Greek means always. If it meant something else, I guess they would have put something else. It means always. It's an attitude of constant joy. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. Look at that. Paul was talking about rejoicing. He was talking about thanksgiving. And now at the end of the book, he's doing the same thing. He's commanding us to rejoice always. Paul, even when I'm in prison? Yeah. Thankfulness, even when my back is bloody from the whip? Yes. Why? Reasons without number. Reasons without number. And then he says, and everything gives thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Why? Because God has some need to be thanked all the time? No, because that attitude is what gives us the capacity for joy. When we see all that God has done, is doing, will do, what does it lead to? Oh, I'm the most blessed. I'm the most blessed. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing in your people. Thank you that I can be a part of it. Thank you that I'm here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then if necessary, go to the lowest realm of why you should be thankful to God. Why are you so thankful to God? I'm not in hell. Thankfulness always. And then he says, do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterance. Now, I know that the quenching of the spirit can have something to do with despising the word of God when it's preached. But it's also linked back to this idea of thankfulness and rejoicing. It is the very opposite of what the spirit would have of us. We should be thankful. We should be rejoicing. And then he says, he says, for what things can we render to God? Now I want you to notice something here. God receives the glory. The steadfastness and faithfulness of the Thessalonians, Paul does not attribute it to their dedication and devotion. Nor does Paul attribute their steadfastness to his own ministry. But he attributes it to whom? To God. All to God. Comes from God. Goes back to God. It's all God. God's done it all. God's done it all. 
Sometimes people have this idea that when they go to heaven, you know, someone will walk up to them and say, you know, hey, what did you do on earth? I don't really think that'll be the theme. It's all about what God did for us on earth. Give me your testimony. My testimony, it's the same as everyone else's here. God. But God. God and God alone. Well, don't you want to talk about something else? Why? God and God alone. Now, there's so much that we could study here, but we just don't have the time. I'm going to go on. I want to give you a quote by Hebert. And if you're ever going to study First and Second Thessalonians, I recommend getting Hebert. He says, what by human standards would have been regarded as a triumph for the missionaries. And what is that? That under persecution, the Thessalonians continued. Their converts stuck. You know, you can hear preachers, I've heard them say that. My converts, they stick. My converts are real. Oh, really? By what, what by human standards would have been regarded as a triumph for the missionaries, Paul humbly acknowledges to be the work of God. Let Christian workers beware of taking credit for results only God can produce. Now, you parents, those of you dot every I, cross every T, and your children are a showcase, if there's any of us like that in here, know this, be careful. Because God would sooner promote parents who were humble and did none of the right things you do rather than a proud man who does all the right things but is proud. Here's something that I want you to see. When you take credit, you are expecting the thanksgiving that belongs to God to be redirected to you. Or, you're saying that it ought to be directed to God and you as though you dwelt in some kind of conjunctive relationship with God. And that's a monster you can't feed. Always wanting thanksgiving. Always wanting praise. Always wanting to be recognized. Very, very dangerous. It will not add to your joy. It will take away from your joy. Our attitude should be like the psalmist in 115.1. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. Everything good that we see in ourselves, in our individual brothers and sisters in Christ, in the church has to do with God's loving kindness and truth. All glory, all praise be to him. If you can ever, if you're ever supposedly used of God to create a big ministry or a big church or something, and then you can write a book about how you did it, well, that doesn't match up very well with the Scriptures. It's about how God did it. It's about how God did it. Now, he says also, on your account, on your account. Look at that. In 3... Verse 9, we rejoice before our God on your account, literally because of you. And you here, and I want to emphasize this, is plural. Paul was giving thanks for what? For all of them. Not just the spiritually elite. Not just those who contributed to the advancement of the church. Not just those who were, you know, doing their part, carrying their load, were a blessing to others. No, he's even given thanks to those who are kind of like weights. Sponges, those that are needy, those that are broken, for all of them. Again, it's something I said at the very beginning of this study several weeks ago, and it's this. You see anybody converted, even the least saint, even the most troubled saint, even the most immature, and they're truly converted, that is a miracle greater than the very creation of the cosmos. And for that, we ought to give thanks. I'll never forget one time I walked in to, do a, to, to preach at this university and this church had put it on and I knew the pastor who was partly responsible and as I walked in there was a praise band. And they were kind of all really cool. I mean, you know, blue jeans with holes in the knees and, and their hair was kind of long and one of them looked kind of like Keith Green, really all bearded up and, and everything. And, and this guy, the pastor, he comes and he goes, Brother Paul, you know, that's my, two of my children up there. 
And, uh, you know, I, I hope that that's, you know, doesn't bother you. They're kind of shaggy. I said, brother, what kind of monster do you think I am? I said, brother, I'd give everything I own, everything I am for my children when they grow up to be what I see in the faces of your children. That guy was banging on a guitar pretty loud, but his face was glowing. That girl, she was singing. She was something. Tears running right down her face. I said, I don't care about the rest. You've got everything to be thankful for. Everything to be thankful for. The smallest of His mercies is worth a lifetime and eternity of thanksgiving. Now, is your life marked by that kind of thanksgiving? You say, no. Okay, I don't want to leave you in the cold. What should you do? You should do what Israel was constantly commanded to do. Go back and look at God's redemptive history in your life. You know the old song, I know it's corny. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Think about what you were. Think about what He's made you. Think about how He's rescued you. Think about every good and perfect gift that is in your life comes from Him. Oh, thankful, thankful, thankful. Now, another thing is prayer on behalf of others. Prayer. Look at uh, verses 10 and 13. 10 through 13. Especially verse 10. He says... As we night and day keep praying most earnestly. Now, there is no way to give more emphasis to the place of prayer in Paul's life. First of all, he says day and night. The genitive here is probably would be best interpreted to say we were praying by night and by day. It doesn't mean he prayed 24 hours a day. It just means through the long hours of the day, through the long hours of the night, you could find Paul involved in prayer. It was a style of life for him. It was like breathing for him. You would see him at different times during the day and even times during the night that he would be praying. Garrod says this, and just think about this and compare your life to this. It is evident from St. Paul's epistles that a very large part of his private life was occupied in prayer and thanksgiving. A very large part of his private life was occupied in prayer and thanksgiving. Now, I don't want to dissect Garrett here or do an exegesis of what he just said. But let me just say this. He says prayer and thanksgiving. And I just want to make this small remark. The idea here, prayer has more to do with intercession on behalf of men. Thanksgiving kind of has more to do with ministry to God. And this is a part where many evangelical and reformed believers really miss it. That there is a real calling for us to minister to God. I mean, in heaven, what do they do? They're ministering unto God. And we've been called to join that marvelous band of saints and angels. And that as we're on our knees just thanking Him. What are we doing? We're ministering. Offering praise. We're ministering unto God. Now, also, the continuity or the, the, the place of prayer in the life of Paul is also seen in the phrase, keep praying. It is a present tense participle indicating continuous action, a style of life. Can you begin to see how much Paul prayed? And how prayer was a part of his life. But also, know this, it wasn't so much a discipline as it was flowing out from real love. From real love. Also, usually the word um, prosukamai is used with regard to prayer. That's a very common word for prayer. Here he uses deomai, which literally means ask, beseech, or beg. We don't need to get caught up. I want to say this right. We do not need to get caught up in some erroneous idea that to constantly be begging or asking God 
shows some sort of greedy or piggish spirit. Yeah, piggish really is a word. It, it, it was, I've met so many people who say, well, you know, I don't ask things from God. As though that was sort of spiritual. Well, we shouldn't be asking for ourselves all the time, but we should ask for ourselves every need. But we should also abundantly be asking for others. Listen to what he says in Psalms, Psalms 81.10. I am the Lord. I, the Lord, am your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. And he's saying, I'm God. I redeemed you. There's nothing greater I could do for you. I have redeemed you. Now, do you think I'm going to withhold things from you? Open your mouth. Prove me on this. Prove me on this. Now, listen to Romans 8.32 if you want a New Testament verse. He who did not spare his own son, redemption, but delivered him over for us all, a redemption that costs a lot more than pulling a bunch of people out of Egypt. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? This idea of believing God, asking God. Paul said, I kept praying, I kept asking. And then he uses the phrase most earnestly. Now, just listen to what this, this, this word is a double, triple compound word. It has a root and two suffixes. But we're going to look at the root and then the most important suffix. First of all, the root, perisos. What does it mean? It means abundant, excessive, extreme. How is he talking about his prayer life? His prayer life was abundant, excessive, and extreme. But now there's a suffix that goes on to that. Uper or iper, depending on how you want to use old or young or new pronunciation of Greek. I prefer iper because it has the idea of hyper. That's where we get that idea. And what he's saying, he puts that with perisos, and what he's actually saying, hyper means over or beyond. So he's saying, I keep praying for you beyond abundant, beyond excessive. My prayer life is beyond abundant. My prayer life is beyond excessive. My prayer life is beyond extreme. My prayer life for you is beyond beyond. Now, how do we fall short of that? Now, I'm going to save you from the, from the grasp of kind of, I don't know, a pragmatic or materialistic or discipline. Prayer has an element of discipline, but here's what I want you to see. Don't go home and necessarily throw yourself into prayer, but go and look at the motive, the thing that's pushing Paul. And what is it? Love. Selfless love. Let's deal with the root of the problem. And that root of the problem is selfless love. Now, the only other place this word is used is in Ephesians 3.20. And listen, just listen as I read the text. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly, same word, beyond, look at that, far more abundantly, beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. It was God's promise of super abundant blessing that led to Paul's super abundant praying. Do you see that? It was just this impetus because it's like, you know, even Spurgeon said, you know, it's like just a checkbook all signed. By God, fill in the blank. Now, I know that wrong doctrine can take what Spurgeon said and twist it into something horrible and distorted. But nonetheless, the way he said it in that context is right. Open your mouth. Ask for yourself. Ask for your family. Ask for your children. Ask for the people of God. Ask and keep asking over, beyond, abundant, beyond, extreme. Now, I just want a couple of thoughts here. This is not a hyperbole or an exaggeration. Paul's not trying to just speak evangelistically. This is true. And here's what I want you to see is Paul saw prayer along with the word of God as the chief means of advancing the kingdom of heaven. 
not only in the lives of individuals, but in mass, in the church as a whole. Old preachers used to say all the time, boy, the battle is won in prayer. Preaching is just clean up. Activities clean up. The battle is won in prayer. Now, I want to point something out that, that Pastor Anthony pointed out Sunday that just literally, I almost... Sometimes I don't know how to deal with you people because I want to start jumping up and clapping and screaming and everything else and you guys just sit there all proper and reformed. Um, but I want you to notice that Paul considered himself to be indebted to God to a point that he would never be able to repay him. He was indebted to God for all that God, all the prayers God had answered, all the things God had done. Paul considered him total, considered himself totally indebted to God and never getting out of debt. But he keeps asking for more. He keeps asking for more. You know, you go to someone over and over and over and you almost you get some sort of sense of shame. They've done so much for me. How can I go back and ask for more? That is contrary to biblical Christian thought. But the idea is he's done so much. Will he not do more? Can he be exhausted? Can his glory, can his kindness, can his graciousness can it be emptied out? Absolutely not. So if he's done so much in your life, you haven't even touched the foothills of this Everest of the kindness of God. He's saying, don't stop. Don't get content with my blessing in your life. Don't get content with how much I've used you. Don't get content. Now, again, I know every time I preach this way, I think, oh, gosh, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking TV evangelists and prosperity gospel. But I'm not going to allow them to rob from me what the scripture is actually saying, because I'm not saying I'm not asking for a new car or a new house. I'm asking for a greater sense of his presence, greater power in ministry in order to advance his kingdom. The good stuff. Not the little stuff. No. As Brother Anthony pointed out, you know, Moses here, I mean, what else can you do? He's got the biggest ministry in the Old Testament. The biggest ministries in the world. Ever. What does it just show you? If you've been converted... You can have the whole world, you can have the whole ministry, you can have it all, and it won't, won't, you won't be content. You see, if you've, been a, if you've become a Christian, you become a new creature with new desires that are so high, if they took the world away from you, it couldn't make you sad. And if they gave you the world, it couldn't make you content. And all the ministry in the world cannot make you content. What can make you content? God's presence. God's presence. Now, how do we develop a capacity for prayer? Because I never want to tell you these things and then just kind of leave you. One, recognition of inability. Recognition of our inability. Now, you can learn this the easy way, or you can be like me and learn this the hard way. You'll probably be like me and do a little of both. Now, what do I mean? How can you learn about your inability? Well, you can do it the easy way. You can just believe what God says about you. That the flesh profits nothing, that in ourselves we can do nothing, that apart from Him we can bear no fruit. You can just go ahead and believe that. Or you can learn it the hard way. Go out there and do just a whole bunch of stuff in your own power, in your own wisdom, your own scheming and plans, and watch it come to nothing. As I've said, you can do it the easy way or the hard way. But the first thing is recognize your inability. The second is recognition of the power of prayer. I really want to encourage you to see how God answers prayer in the Old Testament. But here's something else. I want you to also see how God has answered prayer throughout church history. Now, why is that important? Because sometimes we make this division 
that's unhealthy. We go, yeah, that was in the Old Testament. Or, yeah, that was in the New Testament. Or, yeah, that was with the apostles. Now it's different. No, it's not. That's why it's so helpful to read books like the autobiography of George Mueller or to read E.M. Bounds or other works on prayer. The Return of Prayers is another excellent book. So that you can see, no, this continues on. It really does. He hasn't been exhausted. He never will be. No one has taken him as serious as he should be taken with regard to his inexhaustible supply. Now, to whom is the prayer... Oh, another thing, not only a recognition of the power of prayer, but disciplining ourselves to set times of prayer. Sometimes I'll meet people and they go, well, I don't really pray, you know, like a specific time. I just pray all the time. I am, I'm sorry. I just don't really believe that. I believe that the capacity to pray without ceasing, to make prayer like breath, is learned through disciplined meeting with God. I do believe there are disciplines in the Christian life and that we need to deny our flesh. And here's something. The flesh hates the study of Scripture, but I think this flesh would rather study Scripture than pray because at least the flesh can boast in knowledge. It has nothing to boast about in prayer. Unless, of course, you go proclaim to everybody just how long you're praying. Now, to whom is the prayer raised? Look in verse 11. Now may our God and Father Himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. Now, let me just share with you something. First of all, to unite the Father and Jesus equally as objects of prayer, now that is evidence of deity. Do you see that? You know, everywhere you look in the Scriptures is just evidence of Christ's deity. You don't put somebody less than God in this kind of a conjunctive relationship. Also, I want to point out something. I just had never seen this before. It's true. I've checked it with some Greek scholars. It's really true. It's amazing. Look at, it says, the Father and Son. Okay? You see in our passage, now may our God and Father Himself and Jesus our Lord. So what do we have here? A plurality, don't we? We have two Individuals, two persons, real persons of the Trinity, two persons, plural. But the verb direct in Greek is singular. And you say, well, what does that mean? Well, if you have a plural subject, you're going to have a plural verb. But the fact that they have a plural subject and a singular verb is teaching us what Jesus always said, He and the Father are one. Here we see in the Scriptures, in the New Testament, clear as a bell, both the plurality, the plurality of God and the persons of God. God is one. That the Father and the Son are one. Now, what does Paul pray for? First of all, he prays for greater communion with believers. That we may see your face, verse 10. Paul was not content with anything but face to face communion with these people. Why? Because he loved them. He loved them. Now, I want to ask some questions. What is the typical answer to this question? Why aren't you coming to church? Isn't the typical answer, well, I'm not getting anything out of it, or my needs aren't being met? I, I, now, I do agree you should not be going to a church where you're not being fed the Scriptures. But that I, I think, sometimes appears just too much in our reason for being down on the church because I'm just not getting fed. Or I'm being neglected. When was the last time you heard this? When you ask somebody, or you heard someone ask somebody, why, aren't you, why haven't you been in church? The person says, I've just run out of people to minister to and bless. When was the last time you heard something like that? Or, when was the last time you heard, I've run out of things to talk about with regard to God and Jesus Christ. I think I've exhausted every subject now. Do you see how our neglect of the people of God is just a reflection of our lack of selfless love? Lack of love? Now, I want to show you something here that it, it's not running a rabbit. It's in the text. And it's going to really, I think, encourage you because it has me. In verse 10, he says, 
that we may see your face. What is Paul praying about? He wants to see their face. Why is Paul so shook up in chapter 2? He does not see their face. He does not know what's going on. And what does Paul do? He prays, I want to see your face. Now, what do we learn from this book? Paul is hindered by whom? By Satan. Satan is working overtime to keep Paul from these Thessalonians. Do you see that? So, Paul's praying, I want to see your face. The devil is hindering him to the point where he's not going. Paul's not going to Thessalonica. The devil has hindered him. And so the devil is parading around. Victory, victory, victory. Let me show you how God mocks the wicked. Paul didn't make it to the Thessalonians, at least up to this point. The devil's all smiles. But because the devil won, we now have two epistles, First and Second Thessalonians, that for 2,000 years have strengthened believers all over the world. So as, as all of hell is prancing around, victory, 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 there's a clearing of the throat. Have you noticed two letters have been written that I will preserve not only for the church in Thessalonica, but for my people of all time become a part of that canon of that immutable word and serve to save people and bless people and encourage people for thousands of years. God knows how to mock the wicked, doesn't he? He's not going to be beat. As one Puritan said, you can row with all your might against the will of God and you'll only find yourself a row with all your might away from the will of God only to find that you've rowed right into it. He wins. Always. Always. Now, also, he, a prayer for opportunity to minister in verse 10, that we may complete what is lacking in your faith. Now, we'll look at this just a little bit later. And I'm sorry this is going on, but I really want to get through this chapter. And it's all together. But the one thing that, that I want to point out here is just that Paul does not want this communion for personal gratification. He wants this so he can complete what's lacking in other people's faith. And that's another reason why we come to church, isn't it? It should be to minister to one another. And I know there's a lot of churches, very good churches, they don't have a meal afterwards. Maybe they're too large. But... We not only have a meeting here, we have our fellowship meal. And you know, a lot of people come to me, I, they complain, say, Brother Paul, I have a secular job. I never get to talk about Jesus. I never get to minister. But then come to the church and they continue talking about secular things. And I think that we need to be more intentional about, wow, I get this couple of hours. Because I mean, you guys sometimes stay here just on and on and on. I've got a couple of hours here. I can do what I've wanted to do all week. I can minister to people. Now, having said that, let's not create some kind of task force that's going around listening to conversations, okay? Someone talks about a baseball game and all of a sudden you stand up and start preaching like Whitfield at them. Don't do that. That's not what I'm talking about. But all of us, in our conscience and prayerfully, trying to be a little bit more intentional on that. Now, Here's a big thing here. He also prays that believers will grow in love. Look at verse 12. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you, so that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, who is the author of Christian love? It is God. Hebert says this, the missionaries are well aware that the spiritual growth and development of the readers is not dependent upon their ability to return, but is in the Lord's hands. Paul says here, may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love. It is ultimately the work of God. And that is why prayer is so important. Is it not the will of God specifically stated in the scriptures that we all increase in love? Is that not his will? It is. 
You don't need a special word from God. It's what God says in his word. His desire is that we all grow in love. Now, if we pray according to his will and he hears us, he'll answer. Listen to what John says in 1 John 5, 14 and 15. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. There are certain things, brothers and sisters in Christ, that are in the word of God. They're there. They're commands. If they're commands, they're God's will. We should pray these things for our congregation. We know it's God's will that we abound in love. We know that's the root of all true virtue. Love for God, love for men. Now, let's look at the measure of that love. He says, increase and abound in love. The idea is this. I want you to increase in love until you are super abounding, until you are overflowing. It's not a miserly or meagerly love. I love the word lavished. The grace with which he graced us, he lavished upon us. He doesn't do things meagerly, just pouring it out. And that's the kind of love that we have here. It's not a love that just meets the demand. Okay? It's a love that goes beyond the demand. Notice this. In some of the epistles, we get this idea where God does not meet our need according to the need. God meets our need according to His sufficiency, according to His riches and glory. So the idea here is that we abound in so much love that it's like pouring love into the lap of a person and then it's just falling all over the floor, spreading upon everything. We could almost call it an extravagant, wasteful love. Just throwing it everywhere. Hebert says, love overflowing. Love's overflowing presence is the tangible evidence of a robust faith. Now, the extension for one another and for all people. Literally, for one another and for all. He leaves it open-ended to love everyone. Our brothers and sisters in Christ is one circle, everybody else in the other circle. To love everyone. This is what baffled and eventually conquered the entire Roman Empire. The the Roman authorities, you read history, they didn't talk about, wow, this is amazing, the miracles. They didn't talk about that. They didn't talk about blind people seeing or lame people walking or anything. Do you know what they talked about? How do these people love like this? I mean, after all, they're Scythians, Greeks, Jews, poor, rich. Those with authority, those under authority, slaves, freemen, and they're all together. They have nothing in common and they love each other to the point of offering life for life. And then they love their enemies. This is what? It wasn't debate. It wasn't apologetics, even though it has its place and it's a wonderful thing. It was this extraordinary expression of love. Now, let's look at the goal. Verse 13, and we're getting close to the end. So that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Now, I want to read what I've written here because I want to be very precise. If you look at this, it's kind of difficult. The word to abound in love so that he may establish our hearts without blame. In holiness, in his presence, at the coming of Christ? I mean, how does that work? Well, here's the way that I see it, and and other commentary writers and scholars, much wiser than I, would vouch for the same interpretation. Christ increases, as we pray, Christ increases the believer's love for God and for man. This love strengthens or establishes establishes the heart in that it makes it more resistant to sin, which would demonstrate lovelessness to God and man. So he strengthens the heart with love, and this love 
for God and for men makes you resistant to the temptation to sin against God and against men. In turn, this love also strengthens or establishes the heart, making it more prone to desire the righteousness which would most show love to God and men. And I've written here, true biblical love for God and man is the great route to a blameless and holy life. And apart from it, there is no holiness. Apart from love, there is no holiness. Thus, the heart that loves in this way will have little to fear on the day of judgment. Now, let me read some beautiful things from some men. Barnes writes, the idea is that if charity were diffused through their hearts... If, if love flowed through their hearts, they would abound in every virtue and would be at length found blameless. That it's love that leads us to obey God and to benefit men. Matthew Poole writes in a negative way, the hypocrite will fall in an hour from temptation because he wants or lacks love. What makes you strong against the temptation to sin? Love. You're, tempta you're tempted to sin, but you don't because how can I do this and love God? A man is tempted to some immorality. It's love for God, love for his wife, love for his children, love for his brothers and sisters in Christ. It says no. No. It's love. D. Michael Martin writes, and this is beautiful, blameless, sanctified hearts can only grow and bloom in the soil of a genuine and abundant love. Do you see that? The church today needs this message, but it is a message. Now listen. I'm not an elder here, but I am a preacher. I am older than most of you. So this fits me, fits Anthony, fits... Mark, it's the deacons. And, and that's why I want to lay this at our feet. The church today needs this message, but it is a message they must see their leaders live, not just hear them proclaim. To be true to the Scriptures, today's apostles, he puts in ministers, what he means, today's ministers must demonstrate by their action that loveless Christianity is an oxymoron. That a gospel lacking love is a heresy. And that true Christian maturity is measured by the character of one's love, not the complexity of one's theology. Guys in the MIT program, guys studying to be minted. Yes, you ought to know that theology. It's foundational. We take nothing from it, but the complexity of your theology does not prove the maturity of your faith. Now, how can we cultivate this kind of love? Well, one is recognizing that self-love is the greatest enemy of our souls. Love of self is the greatest enemy to our souls and the greatest hindrance to spiritual growth. We must repent of it vehemently and violently. Now, listen to those words. I mean, you see that spring up? Just, just kill it. Just kill it. Attack it with everything you've got. For those of us who are married, just attack it. Think if we spent more of our time attacking our self, we'd spend less time attacking our spouses. Because ultimately the problem is me and, and you inside us. We've got enough to deal with in our own garden. Another thing is recognizing that selfless biblical love is the fulfillment of all the commands and we must pursue it ravenously. I'll give you an idea what that ravenous, what that means. Viciously, ravenously. Pastor Anthony brought a, a huge box about this big of Girl Scout cookies. I don't know where they came from. And if you could see... It, let me just put it this way. So all, if all of us in the office pursued love as we have pursued those Girl Scout cookies in the last two days, we'd be the most loving men on the planet. 
ravenously. Look, look, go after truth, go after theology, but it's a means to this other thing that if you don't get, everything else is worthless. It's worthless. Now, through renewing the mind is another thing that is absolutely essential to grow in love or cultivating the mind of Christ through the scriptures. Now, let, let me say this. It is wonderful when this kind of love just flows spontaneously, okay? And that's, that's the goal, isn't it? To be so filled with the Holy Spirit, so transformed in our character, that this love just flows blamelessly. But sometimes it's not the case. Sometimes, in the moment, you're caught there, and your mind is engaged, and you know you've got to make a decision. Really? Really? It's a battle in the mind. It can be. It can flow spontaneously. But many times a situation presents itself. Someone is angry with you, put out with you, impatient with you, not giving you what you feel like you deserve, everything else. It becomes a battle of the mind. And in that moment, you must make a decision. And I'm going to say something I thought I would never say. One of the things you need to ask yourself is, what would Jesus do? Now just because someone's put that on a bracelet and turned it into something less than profound. He always watched his father and he did what his father did. You and I should watch the son in the scriptures and respond as he responds. Am I loving at this moment? Am I loving? I've got to make a choice. Which choice does love demand? Also, by allowing the scriptures to cross-examine our deepest motivations. Listen to this, Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit for both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. I submit to you that this week at least, I'm a great example of this passage. Of what this truth is saying in Hebrews. Why? Oh, as a minister, I would tell you about love. I describe love to you. I take you to 1 Corinthians 13. I've memorized it. But as I'm reading Paul, the Word of God, going into joint and marrow and the deepest part of the heart, going, You're not like this. You're not like this. You're not like this. Finally, ministry to others is the way we show love. And, and this is just going to be very quick. Verse 10, we've gone back to, As we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. Katatiso is the word, and it means to complete or per mounts. Greek scholar mounts says to adjust thoroughly, to knit together, to unite completely. Paul is not saying that their faith is defective. He's not saying that what they have is wrong. He's saying their faith is deficient. That they need to grow and mature in that faith. You see the difference? Now, that can be applied to the greatest saint walking on this planet. As a matter of fact, the plural is used here so that he's saying you're lacking in a bunch of different stuff. And again, for the most mature among us, the most mature walking on this planet, I can assure you they are still deficient. We are still deficient in many things. Listen to what John Calvin said. We learn from this that those who are far out, who, who far out distance others are still a long way from their goal. Paul said this, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching toward forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ. Now, is this your heart? Are you wanting your faith, the deficiencies to wane, to become more mature? Well, good, but let me show you even something better. Concerned about the faith also of your brothers and sisters in Christ. Coming here, going to each other's homes in order to make up what is deficient. Now, that doesn't mean that you are the God's scope who you know what's wrong with everybody and you're going to fix it. 
It's not saying that you're looking for areas where everyone else is falling apart and you're going to go fix them. That's not the idea. The idea is more general, is that we all recognize that we have deficiencies and that through our communion and fellowship together, without even knowing what those deficiencies are, through our communion and dwelling together, we grow mutually. In regards to how spiritual you think you are or how unspiritual the person that you're with you think is, listen to what Paul says. For I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you. That's not some charismatic gift. That's just some spiritual blessing that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us, by the other's faith, both yours and mine. It's just... It's not that you've spotted something wrong. It's just that you know, and this is a pleasant thing, that you could go to the most mature man or woman on the planet and you could be a new convert, and yet, by fellowship, not only are you going to gain from them, but they are going to gain from you. Let us have this attitude when we come together to do this. Because what's going to knock over this area yeah, we need to do evangelism. We need to do a lot of things, but it's going to be the love that we have spilled over. Spilled over. All right. Well, let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. and Thank You for the patience of Your people. Oh, dear God. And thank You that... Lord, I'm just amazed. Like... Sunday was one side of this coin and this one's the other side. And how it just all kind of came together. Lord, transform us. Save us. Save your people. In Jesus' name, amen.